verses 20 and 21. And it's in the message. And basically it says, you must love. <laughs> so I just took Basio's book and I took the two <laughs> last verses <laughs> out of this and sent it back to him with no comments at all. But there was obviously, he was, he was reading between the lines, or he wanted me to read between the lines of, you have to go do something, right? In, in those, the way those verses are written. You can't ever quote one verse and think that you're capturing what's being said there. Glory to God, that is so true. But, but that is the common practice in the church today. What a, so he said, and this is, this is what really messed people up. So he's pointing that verse and that, that seemingly says, in his mind, we must do this. Yes. Was well, he considered that John also defines love in that book? No. No. Because he doesn't just talk about love. He defines it. Herein is love. Right. Not that you love God, but that God love. loves you. So when he gets into talking about love later on, whose definition are we applying? Right. What it says to love. Yeah. Right? When it says, he who knows not love. What's the definition? Of is he saying, he who knows not that God is love? Or he that knows not what God has done for them to conquer death in the flesh? Oh, yeah. He who sweet. knows not that God loves them? I mean, do you, do you see? I mean, there's so many different variations. Oh, yeah. You right. can't just pluck a verse out of the Bible and try to establish your own view. It's like, what is John talking about? What's yes. the context? What's the whole book? Yeah, right. What's the whole chapter? The whole chapter? The whole book? What's, What's the, the whole, whole thing about? about? Who's the audience? Why does he say what's it? And to use, I love the fact that, that you have taught us to use scripture to define and comment on scripture. Yeah. That is that is a huge, huge thing in terms of like work, in like terms it. of, you know, just what, what is love, mm -hmm. those, those things, because it takes, it takes all the argument away, right? Says this is what the Bible says. I mean, if you want to argue with me, that's one thing. But you got to argue with God, <laughs> you know, right? It's like it's like in First Peter, it keeps saying, Scripture is not subject to private interpretation. No. You can believe what you want, but you're not free to go interpret that privately and then tell everybody this is what it means. Yeah. Because that's not what it means. And private interpretation is a bit was a big problem to the Jewish people. Every rabbi had their own okay. view of yeah. all the different tracts. Right. There's, I have 30-something volumes of books like that, of different rabbis writing down all their different views of what's written there. Uh -huh. Right. And so they were the, the chief of a private interpretation. Yeah. And so the, the Peter's like, there's no private interpretation of these verses anymore. We've seen what they're talking about manifested in the person of Jesus. And so the scriptures have become real clear. Yeah. The prophecy, the prophetic picture is real clear, right? God will provide himself a lamb to take away the death that we're bringing over the world. God intends to build himself a house out of human flesh that he can dwell in for all eternity. Yes. Right? Right. God intends to once again separate the darkness from the light. And in doing so, remove the darkness and the death from earth and from creation. Right? That's the prophetic picture that we have in Jesus. We see what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is found in glorified immortal flesh. Right? right. That's what the kingdom of God is found in. So when, when a guy says to me, you must love, you want to make that thought as ridiculous as possible for him to see. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you think you can glorify your flesh immortal? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, love is the fruit of glorified immortal flesh. So unless you can glorify your flesh immortal, then neither can you say you can produce love. And so whose responsibility is it to produce the love? And it's like this guy thinks that you're saying we won't love. He's so caught up on thinking about what he should do yes. instead of how a thing happens. Mm. Right? And so, yes, love will happen. The question isn't whether or not love will happen. The question is, how does love happen? Right? Right. And so that's what you're busy talking about. You're busy preaching the thing that will produce love. He's busy saying we should love. Yeah. Exactly. Love is not something you can perform. It's something that happens to you that you experience. Mm -hmm. That should you taste the love of God, it will do something to you. Right? It's not a thing you go and perform. And even after you're busy loving people, it's not like your mind is filled with, well, I'm performing love. 
I'm performing love. I'm performing <laughs> love. Right. It's not like you got your board there. Even the, whether you be weighing that is a wrong kind of a thing. Yeah. Even yeah. that you would have that type of thinking in your head where you're self-examining to see if you're loving or not betrays your your heart. It reveals that your heart is filled with the carnal mind. And then someone say, well, doesn't some, doesn't, aren't there verses that talk about that? Yeah, there's verses that talk about that when you're talking about someone calling themselves a rabbi or a teacher right. or someone claiming to be a prophet, which a prophet is just anybody coming to talk to you about God. Right? So any guy or gal coming to you claiming to talk about God, go ahead, put them on that metric and decide whether or not you see the love of God yeah. manifesting in them. And not the kind of love that the world calls love. Right? right? The, the world's idea of love is not the love of God. Right. Being nice to somebody is not the love of God. Right? It doesn't take eternal life to be nice to a person. Right. The scriptures talk over and over. Jesus talks, I think, in Luke 6 about how even a sinner can be good to his friends or people that he likes. Or a sinner would be someone who doesn't have eternal life. Right. Even they can be nice to people. So it's not about whether you're nice or palatable or doing good deeds. It's about, can you love a guy that's nailing you to a tree? Yes. Do you feel love for your enemies? Do you feel love for people that slander you? Do you prefer their lives over your own? That's what the love of God looks like. And you're not supposed to measure individual people by that kind of a thing, but should a person make themselves the explainer of Christ, then they are going to be judged that way. And James talks about that. Yeah, right. He says, you don't all want to be teachers of the Scriptures because you're subjecting yourself to a greater level of judgment mm. because you're going to put yourself on display for everybody to see, and they're going to scrutinize everything you say, scrutinize everything you do. They're going to form judgments about you based on what you say, based on what you do. You maybe don't want that, right? Yeah. And so if you want to judge somebody claiming to be a prophet, and again, a prophet is not someone that can tell you your future, it's someone that is explaining God. Yes. Right? Right? I can show you people busy with voodoo that can tell you when your birthday was. Mm -hmm. Right? That doesn't make them a prophet. So that's the way you weigh that out. So if people want to judge me by whether or not they, they thought they see the love of God in me, I'm subject to that. Yeah. Because I'm here every week claiming to know God. Yeah. And claiming to teach God. And so you should. Right? Look to see. It's like what Jesus talked about. You can know a tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the fruit you see being produced out of me? Exactly. Right? That's how you're going to look at what am I saying. Yeah. John's talking about that. He's talking about guys who were trying to hijack the church and were exalting themselves as teachers in the church. And so that's one of the things he's breaking down. Amazing. Amazing. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, hey. How are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. We just doubled the class. <laughs> well, that's one of the things I really like about this because I've, I've spent a couple of days going through, and, and I think John does a John Fazio does a, a very good job of showing how we experience love, and it's not something that we go do. And I think I think the way he is put together his, his translation and paraphrase is excellent in that regard. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you can, and you can decide for yourself, but you may think it's valuable at some point to say, whoever this guy is, whatever his name is, do you, th are, are you thinking that I'm saying we won't yeah. experience the fruit of love? Yeah. Because uh, the question isn't whether or not we're going to be filled with the love of God. The question is, how does that happen? I'm talking to you about how it happens. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And when I think of how it happens, I'm reminded of the great Apostle Paul who said that he was arrested by the love of Christ. He didn't say that he had to go perform love or that he should love. He said he became arrested by the love of Christ. That, that's talking about something taking you captive. It's not talking about something that someone told you to do and then you go out and do it. It's talking about something that you woke up one day and it happened to you. And you find that there's no way out of it. Right? Like you can't get free from it. Right? And Paul even goes on to describe how he got arrested by the love of Christ. Because he saw that if one guy died for all, then all people were suffering at the hands of death. 
And if this one guy came and loved these other people so much that he'd rather die himself than let them die, I've been arrested by that guy's love for all people, right? And I'm coming to tell them that this guy saw fit not to let their sin be imputed to them, but to take it upon himself so that they could be delivered from death. And I'm busy knowing every human being I come in contact with based on the love I see that Christ has for all people, right? I've been arrested. I've seen how well God has thought of all people and that God rather die himself than let them die. And that has blown my mind and caused me to see great value in all people. And that's arrested me with love for them, right? How can I, then you become like God. You can't deny the love you feel in your heart for a person. So language of you should or you must, that language does not fit with, I can't help myself. <laughs> right? right? It does not fit. It, it, they, they can't be in the same category. Right? And it, there's many examples, and we use some um, in the Bible study. Does a husband come and tell his wife, you must produce children for me? Does he command her to bring forth children? Or does he produce the children in her? Um, the, the vine and the branch. Yes, right. Does the vine tell the branch? You should produce fruit, or does the vine produce the fruit in the branch? And so when the branch sees fruit being born in its life, does the branch think about how it brought forth the fruit, or does the branch think this is some glorious fruit that the vine brought forth in me? After the woman bears the, the child for the husband, and the child's acting up, does the woman not say to the husband, your son, <laughs> your daughter, <laughs> you <did this> <laughs> Does the mother not? Your son, listen to what your son did today. Listen to what your daughter did today. Because she knows he's the one that produced the, the seed in her. Right? And so the whole, the whole way of thinking about the, that is corrupt. It's corrupt. And it, 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 it doesn't speak to how it actually happens. And it gets your focus on your own ability instead of God's ability. And the whole point is, you could sum up all of the commandment in this. This is the words of Jesus. This is the words of Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's what he says. He goes on to say, if you read it in Matthew in the Greek, and the result of that will be that you will love your neighbor. The second thing, when you look at it in the Greek, it says, and this will come forth out of that. You shall find love in your heart for your neighbor. So he talks about that coming out of this. And what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength? Because it doesn't mean about you performing something. It means to not make the works of your own hands that which can feed you with life. And it means to make the work of God that which can feed you with life. And so, how do you love God? The way you love God is you let Him love you. Right? The way that you love God is that you believe on the work that He's done instead of the work that you can do. Now, if you take your mind, Zai, off of your own works, and your mind's eye gets fixated on the work of God, then you will find love born in your heart. So if you desire love to be born in your heart, who's the one that can perform a work to produce love in you? God. So let me now think about and talk to God about the work he performed. And as I walk in his good work, I'll find his good work is even able to produce the fruit of love in me. Right? And so that's the whole point. Let's first diagnose what produces love. Is it you and me or is it God? Okay, if it's God then don't you think we ought to talk about how it is God got it right to produce love in us? <laughs> don't you think that's what we should be talking about? I mean, what's the seed that produces love? Right? It's an incorruptible seed that produces the fruit of love. The Bible talks about seed all the time. Sure. It also talks about the guy who planted the seed in his heart. It says that guy woke up day and night and saw nothing and then woke up with a big crop and says he didn't know how it got there. That's right. <laughs> so it's not like God comes and says, you're supposed to have a crop. And you need to get busy producing the crop. Because then you've been living by the sweat of your brow. And you know very well how that seed produced crop. Because you've been slaving for 10 hours a day. And you feel tired. Right? Right? You, 
You're playing football right now, ain't you? Yeah. You you know all the work you had to do in order to play the game, don't you? Yeah. You're not like, how did I get this game? <laughs> <laughs> You're busy thinking about, I don't know if they still do it, the belly flops, the sprints, the pain, the suffering. You're busy thinking, that's how I got in this game, and I remember how bad that hurt. Right? Well, with the farmer, the guy looks up, and he he's not got no remembrance of how he has all, because he wasn't the one tilling the ground. Right. Someone else was tilling the ground. And so the cares of this world, one of the cares of this world could be, I got to love people. You could be carrying the care of loving people. And you could be carrying the burden of producing love. That will choke out the power of the seed. That will choke out the power of God's work to produce love in you because you're busy thinking about your own tilling. Sure, right. Where God tilled the ground and God produced eternal life inside of a human being right. that conquered death inside of a human being. He done a work to serve you with life. He done a work to produce life in you. The reason why he's called Father is because he's going to father love in you. That's the whole point of calling God Father. Yeah. Is that you become like a little child. So your mind isn't filled with what you should do. Your mind is filled with what God has done. That's fear and trembling. Fear and trembling is that you're so in awe of what God has done that you're, you can't even think about what you can do. Right? Yes. And you, you become free from considering it. I remember when I was a little boy, I was so in awe of my dad that I saw my dad running real fast, and I thought, my goodness, like what that guy can do. Wow. And then we would go run road races together. And in those road races, man, I was just a little kid, and he was a trained adult. But I'd get so captivated and in awe of what he could do that I would lose sight of myself and I would just run faster in the race watching him, just keeping up with him. And so the whole idea of God as Father is you become so in awe of his work that you ain't thinking about your own works. And the day you're thinking about your own works is the day you're not knowing God as Father. talked about that the last couple of weeks that's really to come to grips with that to understand what the true definition of a father is you know it's really important I think I did a message too called the great command is all about grace yes. where I broke down Matthew yeah, you did. where Jesus breaks down all of the law yeah. which is Deuteronomy which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength Rich. now we automatically decide what that means but Deuteronomy tells us what that means is to set your eyes on the work of God and not your own work. That's why it says you shall have one God, the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods other than him. What that means? Other gods you made with your own hands. You shall not make the works of your own hands your food for life. When Satan came to Jesus when he was starving and he was dying and he said, turn those stones into bread, that would have been for Jesus to have another God other than the Lord his God. Right? And so he loved God in that place. How did he love God in that place? Man shall not find life by bread alone, but by every word of God. Right? So he comes and says, in the day I find myself in the place where I need life, I have one God, the Lord my God, and I'm not going to be able to serve myself with life by the bread I can create with these two hands, but there's a bread from heaven that will come from the Father that will give me life. He had one God, the Lord his God. Right? Right. He had... On the cross, he had one God, the Lord his God. When he cried out, Abba, he was actually fulfilling Deuteronomy 6, which says that you have one God, the Lord your God. And if you talk to a Jewish guy, and I remember talking with Joe about this when I had the teflon wrapped around my head and my arm. When you talk with a Jewish, when you talk with a Jewish guy, they'll tell you when a Jewish person is dying, do you know what they say out of their mouth? I have one God, the Lord my God. I have no other gods other than him. They're taught to quote that because they think that's the key to righteousness, yeah. to salvation. So when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, Father, he, he didn't make his own ability to clothe himself as God. He had one God, the Lord his God. And that, that produced love in his heart for even his enemies that were there nailing him to a tree. You know, um, when Brian, our son, Yeah, give me the the CD that uh, Greg did on um, Slippery Slope. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. He said, that is my absolute favorite. I said, really? Because he, you know, he loves getting them. I said, why is that? Because, he said, because the world is always coming at me. And, and I just so happen to be reading in Philippians right now, in, in Philippians 3, where Paul is talking exactly about that. And said, the world is constantly trying to steal or make you work or eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and not life. And if you do that, I mean, he was pretty profound with this. He said, you don't know him or yourself. It's like, whoa. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that, uh, that's, a, that's a very strong statement that Paul's making, and just what you're saying here, that uh, we won't know ourselves or him, or peace and joy and the fruits of the Spirit. We will not have them. No. We will strive. Yeah, we'll strive to have them. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Cain was striving to have the fruit of the Spirit. Adam was striving to have the fruit of the Spirit. Because they thought, I should be clothed in these things. Adam thought, I should be clothed in peace, in love, in joy, in kindness. It's not right that I'm not. And then he got busy trying to produce it. Cain said, I'll be exalted by being wrapped in the fruit of God's life. That's what it's talking about when it says he produced fruit from the ground. And he came to God with the fruit. And so those guys, man, it's, it's so sad. And so you might think about it. Do, do these people think I'm saying we won't love? Yeah. Because the question isn't whether we will love or not. The question is, who's going to produce the love in us? Right. Is it us or is it God? You probably get all of them to say God. Yes. Right. Right. So then the next question is, now how does God get that right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should be talking about. How does God get it right? To produce the fruit of his life in us. How does he get it right? How does he how does he work that? Right? And then listen, the fruit of the Spirit is all the fruit of eternal life. So then you could make it simpler and say, How does God get it right to get eternal life in us? Do we strive for eternal life? Do we have to perform? Eternal do you perform eternal life? Do you think God expects you to produce eternal life? In yourself. No. If God doesn't expect you to produce eternal life in yourself, then how could he expect you to produce the fruit of eternal life in yourself? Yeah. <laughs> See, it's, it's real foolish then. Do you, we should love. That's like God saying, you should bring yourself out of the grave. Right. God didn't get down, God didn't come down in Jesus and look at all the graves and say, What's wrong with you guys? Don't you know you're not supposed to be dying? Don't you know that there's no death in me? Get with it, man. Come out of the grave. You don't see God doing a thing like that. You see God realizing these guys can't bring themselves out of the grave. If you can't bring yourself out of the grave, then neither can you produce the love. So unless you can say you should bring yourself out of the grave, you cannot say you should love. Right? Now, if you're busy talking with a person who thinks they're walking in the truth, and they're void of the fruit of the Spirit, you could use that to point to them not walking in the truth. Right. If someone is adamant or obstinate about what they're busy with, then you could use the law, that would be to use the law, to point out that you're not, you're, you're not clothing upon yourself. You're still naked. Right. You, you see? Yeah. That would be the only way. You wouldn't point it out to send them off to try to perform it. You would point it out to show them that they can't perform it, that they can't produce life in themselves. Right? right? That would be the whole point. Like Jesus talking to the Pharisee in Luke 18, the parable with the Pharisee in there with the sinner. And the Pharisee, they're both praying to God, and the sinner says to God, Lord, I've got nothing. I'm bankrupt. I'm empty. I saved you doing something for me. I'm just a wretch. And the, the Pharisee is busy telling God, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this pathetic sinner next to me. I do X, Y, Z. I do all the right things. I do this, that, and the other. Right? Yeah. And Jesus says, which way, which one do you think went away justified? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? So he's pointing out to the Pharisee the shortcoming of his wisdom. He's not pointing out to the Pharisee to try to get the Pharisee to work. Right? And so in, you, there can be examples in the Bible where somebody will point out the fruit of a thing in order to show that that's not the wisdom of God. 
right? Yeah. And that James does that. Yes. Right? He listen, you guys are busy judging these guys. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you how do you think that same wisdom's gonna judge you? <laughs> right. You think it's gonna let you off the hook? No, it's gonna <laughs> condemn you too. Right. So rather let us all live and judge one another by the perfect law of liberty. Right? Yeah. Let us thus judge that. But that's a great question to have with people. It's not that some Christians think we're not going to experience the fruit of the Spirit and other Christians think we are. That's what like gets set up in this whole grace law thing or grace and non-grace. Right. It's like they think that one side is saying we'll be free from the works of the flesh and we'll experience the fruit of the Spirit and the other side is not saying that. It's hogwash. Yeah. Both sides are saying that God desires for us to experience freedom from the works of the flesh and to experience the fruit of his life. Mm -hmm. Both sides are saying that. Now the question is, how are we going to see that happen? How, yeah. how are we going to see that happen? That's where the difference comes in. They want to paint you in the image of someone who's saying, we won't love. That's how they can just cast away your theology sure. real easily. Right. No, no, we all agree that we'll love. The question is, how are we going to find that happening to us? <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the raising of the dead is a really good example of that, where... Jesus told the people of his day, he said, listen, marvel not at this. The day is coming when the dead who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, where did their resurrection from the dead come from? Did it come from them or the, or the fact that they were dead in their graves, but they heard the, verse, the voice of who was speaking to them? Yeah, the hearing of faith. The hearing of faith. I, I love this when I heard this uh, from Paul. He was talking about not only the the, the Jewish but the Gentiles, and that they were <clears throat> ignorant of his gift of freedom. And this is why I love it. The, the word ignorant didn't mean they were stupid. To break it down, it was ignoring, ignorant. They were ignoring the gift of freedom and trying to produce life on the earth. They were blind. Yeah. They were blind thinking that the word of God was that you must love. Instead right. of, I promise you to decorate you with my love. Right. The, the big difference. So they hear you should love instead of God promising them to oh, produce love in them. Which is what it's always been. Just like he told Abraham, I will make you the father of many nations and exceedingly fruitful. That's mm -hmm. what he told Adam. The gospel is the same thing again. God has promised us that he will produce, he will father the fruit of his life in us. Right? That's the promise. And so, if we want to do anything, let us start talking with God about how he does it. Man, that's amazing. You're going to produce your life in me? How are you going to do that? <laughs> how are you going to get that right? I never wake up in the morning and say, Honey, if I do enough for you today, will you love me? <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> I know she does. Well, thank the Lord. <laughs> and if you think you need life in any area, God is called Father. And you don't have to understand anything other than that. And you can say, I don't know what that guy Greg is talking about, but God, he said your Father. And that means that you are going to produce your life in me. I need life. I need peace. I need love. I need joy. I need contentment. I need rest. I ain't got none of those things. I've been trying hard to have them, and I don't have them. But if you really are Father, then I need you to come and Father that in me. Because I need it. Right? There you go. That's the most powerful prayer you could ever have. Mm -hmm. That's the most powerful thing you could ever pray to God. I have a little glitch that happened when you said about the two people that prayed and the one said that he was a wretch. And, and then Jesus said, which one do you think went away justified? Mm -hmm. And so for now, all this, this last several years been eliminating wretch from the song Amazing Grace because I don't see myself as a wretch anymore. But then Jesus said he went away justified. So I'm like, what? what? Well, because a person could feel that they're a wretch. Oh, that yeah. doesn't mean God thinks they're a wretch. Mm -hmm. And so that sinner there talking to God about his inadequacies and his his inadequacies, inadequacies, <laughs> <laughs> inadequacies <laughs> yes. weaknesses, despising himself over them, what it would look like for that guy to be justified would be for God to cleanse his conscience from all his negative judgments about himself and for him to hear God say, you are my beloved son okay. in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so he would be right? justified. Exactly. Right. 
But I got to be honest. I once I got out of my legalistic view of grace, I no long I no longer mind singing Amazing Grace, who saved a wretch like me. Yeah. Because a wretch like me could just be I desire to love and have peace and joy, and I don't. Uh -huh. Oh, wretched man that I am. Right? That's what Paul's kind of talking about in Romans 7. He was talking about his frustration with desiring to love and to have peace and to have joy and then fi not finding that manifesting in him. But the more he tried to have those things, the more he found the fruit of death manifesting in him. Oh, wretched man that I am. It's like frustration. Right? Like I come in and I desire for that internet to work. And that internet is not working. And the more I try to get that internet to work, the worse that it gets. Now, do you think that my frustration is getting less as it continues to not work? And I keep trying? It's getting worse. And so my frustration level is rising. Oh, wretched man that I am is just that I would desire so bad for the internet to work and it isn't working. And I find within myself I don't possess the ability to fix the internet. And the more I try to fix the internet, the worse it gets and the more frustrated I become. Oh, wretched man that I am. Right? It can be that also. And so... It, God never saw man as a wretch, but I don't think it'd be inaccurate to say that man saw themselves as a wretch. No, that's, that's true. true. Absolutely. And, and so once you get yeah. cleared up, it said to the pure in heart, all things are pure. When I first got into grace, I was very legalistic about my grace. Right. Meaning every word's got to be said the right way. Every song's got to be sung the right way. <coughs> it's got to be the right way or it's wrong. Well, that's just another form of legalism. Yes, yeah. right. right. The pure in heart will be so filled with grace that they'll begin to see the heart behind things instead of judging the words. And I can see the heart that was in that guy. He was looking at the life that he had. And he, this is a wretched life. And he realized it when he crashed into the shore. That this life of uh, trading, buying and selling slaves, it's a wretched life. And that's why he sang the song. And he talked about how God saved him from a wretched life. And God did save him from a wretched life. And God did save all of us from a wretched life. Yes. And so to look at the life that's born from death and to call that a wretched life, I, that's a true okay. statement. Yeah. It's, it's an accurate statement. Right? And when, you, when you hear the rest of the words of the song, when we've been there 10,000 years, mm -hmm. bright shining as the sun, he knew what he was saved to. Yeah. Not just what he was saved from, but what he was saved to. That's right. And you can imagine how that guy felt. Yeah. Right? Like we all think people rejoice in the bad that they do. Right? Like, they celebrate inside their heart. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll use one of the most heinous people in the history known to human beings, outwardly. Herod. Everybody thought Herod felt real good about all the heinous things he did. Right? All the killing of the babies. Yeah. Everybody thought he celebrated that. Well, what would it look like when the angel was in the corner of the room? Do you think he was celebrating all the things he did? Why not? Certainly, if he really thought all those things were the fruit of life, he wouldn't have felt ashamed in the presence of the angel. It ate him up. He would have thought, what? Wasn't that stuff good? <laughs> what you mean, bro? <laughs> he wouldn't have felt ashamed yes. or confounded. Right? right? right. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that's how you would describe justified. Right? You could have a negative report about yourself, and then God would come and show you his report mm -hmm. of your life. That would justify you. It would vindicate you from your own judgments. Listen, another person's judgment can't do anything to you unless you agree. That's right? So, that's so true, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the only, that's the only reason other people's judgments could, could hurt you is if you think they're right. Yeah. Or you also have it. Right? And so God, you need to be cleansed from your own judgments, not other people's judgments. Because you won't care about other people's judgments if you get free from your own judgment. And so that's one of the most powerful things Paul come and said. It matters not if you judge me. Yea, I judge not my own self. Right. And so what he basically comes and says there, you guys can say whatever it is like about me because it doesn't impact me because I've been set free from my own judgments about myself. So he was corrected. He was corrected by God. Yeah. Right? And so we need to be set free from our own judgments about ourselves. Right? The accusation of the evil one could never mean something to us if it didn't trigger something we were already insecure about within ourselves. Yes. It wouldn't work. Right. We would think, what you talking about, bro? <laughs> right? We would rebuke what he said. But he comes and points at things that can trigger us. Right? Like, it wouldn't bother me 
if people have said I was intense, unless I first concluded I was too intense. So if people said Greg's intense, and I didn't have, I didn't think that was negative, I would be like, glory to God, yeah, I'm like the Hulk. Yeah, I flip over a table, and I might do a little dance around it. Yeah! Right? But because I was taught very young that that's a character flaw, when somebody says I'm intense, I judge it negatively. So then I need to be set free from my judgment, not theirs. Right. It's like my wife's conversation and my conversation, right? That she always thought that she was stupid. That's right. And I never said anything like that. No, and I remember when that happened in the yeah. middle of Bible study. She like, mm -hmm. that, that rivaled the thing about who you are is good. Right. I mean, you like, poof. Well, the way he said it right now wasn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> I was stupid. Yes. That's what the problem was. Because you always thought you were stupid. But I didn't know that that's why. <laughs> so that, no, and we don't know why. And we go through life. Guys, we go through life with our own insecurities, and then we interpret other people's behavior towards us through our own insecurities. Yeah. We look at them, and we think they're busy in their head with the same things we're busy in our head about ourselves. Listen, man, I promise you, they ain't thinking about me that much. You know why? Because they're thinking about themselves and their own insecurities. They're busy trying to feel better about their own insecurities. Or pointing out your insecurities. No, no. And a lot of times, the way that works out is they're going to make you feel bad about your insecurities. But, I mean, we, 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 we look at people's view of us through our view of ourselves. They don't see you like you see yourself. Well, we do the that's same thing with God. That's the same way we look at Him. Yeah. That's, that's called projection. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And we, we, we'd all do better off that when we felt that going on in a relationship, that we stopped and dealt with God with our own insecurity mm -hmm. instead of thinking they really think that about us. No, no, you think that about you. That's right. Now let's go, go off with God and talk about what you think about yourself and ask Him, right? And that's freedom. To heal you. To heal you from because you won't care what people say. Why do you think Jesus didn't care what people said about him? He judged not his own self. You were never created to live by your own judgment. You were created to live by your father's judgment. Right? And you were created to find life from what he thought about you. And for you to walk in his good judgment about your life. Right? Well, the world doesn't want that to happen. So the world wants to come and give a judgment about your life. It wants to take everything it sees in you. It wants to take all the information in the world about where life is found. It wants to present it to you, and it wants you to judge yourself based on that. Right? It wants you to look into the world as if the world is the mirror that you're looking at to compile information about yourself. What do I look like? Do I look like what the world says a good person would look like? Do I have the things that the world says a valuable person would have? Do I talk the way the world says a person who is highly esteemed should talk? We're looking in the world for a mirror, and then we're forming a conclusion about ourselves from the world. Instead of looking in the face of Jesus as if we were looking in the mirror and seeing that Jesus is God coming to introduce us to ourselves. God's like, you, I know you, you think you know yourself. You don't know yourself at all. Let me show you who you are. Bluff. Here you go. Right? Yeah. And as you begin to behold yourself in the face of Jesus, it sets you free from all the judgments you have about yourself mm -hmm. and your life. Mm -hmm. And it, you, it set, then you'll be free from other people's judgments because you'll have been free from your own judgments. Right? Yeah. And that's the most powerful thing you could do is you could decide that you don't know anything. <laughs> the most powerful thing you can do is decide that you don't know anything. I'm so sorry. You guys aren't 18 yet, are you? No. Well, you can't decide that your parents don't know anything yet. <laughs> two more months. Two more months. And two more months. But the most powerful thing any of us could do is say to ourselves, we don't know anything. None of our judgments are true. We have no reason to believe they're true. Why do we even believe they're true? What makes you think that your judgments are true? Who told you they're true? The most powerful thing we can do is recognize our judgments aren't true and recognize there's only one whose judgment is true. It's God. Well, there's good news for us. God has come and discerned everything for us. So we can talk to him about what he said. Right? That's one of the first things I do with anything is when I'm thinking something is true about myself or a situation or other people 
or something going on in the world, the first thing I hear is God's voice saying to me, who told you? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, who told me that? Why do I think that's true? Where did I get that from? Right? Did I get it from God? Well, if God didn't tell me, who told me? And if God's not the one who told me, why would I think it's true? Why am I running down the road with it like it's right? Do you see and, what I'm saying? And the little world word, at least in my mind, is, is because, is, keeps coming up, right? Because, well, who told you? Because, right? Because I see this, because I see that. We just got to get rid of because. Yeah. Because we live by sign. Yes, exactly. But there's one sign to live by, it's the resurrected Jesus. Hallelujah. Christ crucified. Yeah. The, the Jesus dying on the cross for the sin of the world. And you see the world's judgment about him, don't you? Yeah. Wouldn't it judge about Jesus? That he was a worm. Yeah. That he was re despised and rejected of God. Mm -hmm. That he was not God's son. Those were all the judgments of the world. And then what happened? God showed up and did what? Boom. Claimed Jesus as his son. <laughs> Glorified him with immortality. That's the judgment of God. Yeah. Right? If you, if you live by, if you live for people's acceptance, you will die from their rejection. Oh, wow. That's Hold up. Got to get on my list. <laughs> I, mean, I love that one. Just how it is. Absolutely. Say that again. If you live for people's acceptance, you will die from their rejection. You know, and, and part of that has to do with just what he was talking about, um, your own self. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I could say something to Jill. Uh, actually even meant for, for love, you know, a loving statement, but she didn't accept it that way. She heard it differently, and we all can do that. Those filters really get in the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking about how those lies get planted to begin with, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm thinking back to how I first got that seed planted um, that I was stupid. Because I was a really good student. I mean, I was a pretty much straight-A, some B student all through school. And then what happened was I started comparing myself to this guy who was in the National Honor Society. When I was a junior in high school, he was a senior. I can remember sitting at the kitchen table in my house growing up, and I needed to write a paper. And he was there, and he said, well, let me help you. So. I'm trying to write this paper, and my vocabulary wasn't nearly what his was. So he would, he said, well, tell me, I don't know if you even remember this, tell me what it is you want to say, and I'll help you. So he would, I would tell him what I wanted to say, and he would put in all the <laughs> insert of big words, you know, the, the words that I would never use. So that's when it started, because up until that point, I really felt I was smart, and I was a good student, because I was a good student. You know, I was smart, I was talented, I had, but, but then I started the comparing. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of us, you know, fall. Because we compare ourselves with others. And I thought, well, he's way smarter than I am. I was never in the National Honor Society. And I don't even know these big words he's putting in my paper. So then I thought, well, compared to him, I'm not smart. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where that seed first start, started getting planted. Yeah. So I think that comparison thing can really screw us up. Yeah. There's, a, there's an inherent flaw in comparing yourself to others. Yes. Because everybody thinks they're better than you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're comparing yourself to them, you're never going to win. You're never going to win. You're doomed to loss. But yeah, the, the, right. the, the compare, you'll always see lack. The yeah, you'll, the, always, you'll, you'll always see right? lack if you yes. compare yourself to anything other than Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that means seeing yourself in Jesus. Yes. Yes. Not seeing yourself as different than Jesus and then comparing the two. Right? Right. Yeah. And so when you compare yourself with something, you should be comparing the resurrected Jesus with something. Right? And so, he equated himself to us. So Cindy, if she's looking at Jay and she's weighing herself up against Jay, she should weigh Jay up against the resurrected Jesus. Is Jesus lacking in that situation? Then neither can you be lacking in that situation. But the comparison thing would be a symptom of looking in the world for a mirror. Yeah. That's looking at, you're looking for something to weigh yourself in the balance with to determine if you're as you want to be or not. Yes. 
Every human wants to believe that they're as they ought to be. Right? Sure. We all want to think that we're straight. I'm straight. Look, I'm straight. I'm good. We all want to think we're good. But what are we going to use to figure out if we're good or not? <laughs> right? right? Well, then we start looking at our friends. And we look and see, well, are we good compared to them? Well, maybe he gets more girls than me. Or maybe he plays baseball better than me. Or maybe he swims faster than me. Or maybe he's smart. Do you see how all the comparisons start coming in now? And then you start judging yourself as lacking or abounding in a certain area. And then you say, I'm not as I ought to be. Right. And so everybody first starts with that. They de a desire to see that they are as they ought to be. And then they're searching for evidence to prove that they are as they ought to be. Mm -hmm. And then if you're looking in the world for the evidence, you're only going to find evidence that says one thing you lack. Right? Maybe you got it all. One thing you lack, though. Right? And But listen, the world has something you can do to fix the one thing you lack. Right? Listen, I think I'm pretty straight. You know what the world might come and say to me? One thing you lack. You ain't got no hair. <laughs> the world would come and say, but you can have a surgery. And you can get hair again. And then you can be as you ought to be. Right? And so the world will come and point at the thing that says isn't as it ought to be, and then it will tell you how you can get that. Right? And that causes you to live from insecurity. But God, God says, well, we gotta, we got to solve this problem. we got to come and persuade them that they are as they ought to be. The only thing that can persuade them of that is if we manifest ourselves inside of human flesh, a human being, so they can see themselves in the face of this glorified human being and find the testimony of their life in this glorified human being, right? And through finding the testimony of your life in the face of this glorified human being, what will happen is, is that will persuade your heart that you are as you ought to be. And you'll stop looking to the world for evidence, right? It's kind of like in a relationship. And I'm speaking as a fool, because ideally you wouldn't want the relationship to be inse insecure like this, right? Well, the moment that Becky and I got together and Becky approved of me, I no longer cared what any other women thought. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because this woman has validated me. And so I no longer cared what any other woman thought. Right? And it's, it's that kind of a thing with God. When you see the testimony of your life in yourself in the face of Jesus, it convinces you that you are as you ought to be. Mm -hmm. And then you stop weighing your personhood in the balance or on the scale that the world has created. And the world has created a scale. What's your size? What's your skin color? What's your hair color? How much hair do you have? What's your weight? What's your job? What's your money? What's your vocabulary? What's your degree? What's your... All those things, it's weighing in the scale. And it's trying to get you to weigh yourself up against all of that. Right? And it's trying to get you to weigh yourself up against what other people think you should have. Because other people are filled with their own knowledge of what is good and what is evil. Right. And if they look at you and think you don't have something that they think is good to have, they'll try to put you under that also. And try to get you to conform to what they think is good. You know how many people wanted to make me conform to what they thought was the good way to preach? Every day. Every week I get it. People telling me, oh, you should preach like this. Oh, you should talk that way. Oh, you should move less. Why do you think they're telling me that? Because they have their own judgment about how I should be. Right? Now, until I saw myself in the face of the resurrected Jesus, I cared what they thought I should be. Because I thought in order to be all that I should be, I had to be everything they thought I should be. And I was living that way, trying to be everything that every person thought I should be so that they could have a good time in the world. Then I realized I was making myself out to be everybody's God. Because if everybody's good time is based upon me being conformed into whatever image they think I should be in, then I'm being their God. Right? And so when I saw myself in the face of Jesus, and I saw that was the testimony God had given about my life, it set me free from looking at what everybody else th thought I should be and then trying to be that. Yeah. And it didn't just set me free from caring what they thought. It allowed me to let them have their judgments and not be upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. Because before, when it did upset me, I'm busy trying to convince everybody the intensity is good. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it is good. It's a, that is how it's supposed to be. 
here's why it's good. And you have all your, your doctrinal ducks in a row about why the intensity is good. Don't, haven't you read in the, in the scriptures, brother, where it says that John was a voice of one crying in the wilderness? Go read what it means to cry. It means for a guy to be uh, gregarious. Right? And so th there was a, a period of time where it's like, no, no, the intensity is good, the intensity is good, the intensity is good. And then once I saw the testimony of myself in the face of Jesus, it cleansed my heart from intensity being good or evil. And then I no longer cared if people thought I was too intense. I was free from their judgment, but I was also free to let them have their judgment. I didn't come and argue with them about whether or not I was too intense. Glory to God. Let me point you to a guy who doesn't move at all. <laughs> let me point you to someone whose eyes don't get big, whose forehead doesn't squinch up, who doesn't get pitchy. And you can receive from that guy. But I promise you, if their judgment about you stings, then you're going to be busy trying to either become what they think you should be, yeah. or you're going to be busy trying to explain to them how they're wrong. Yes. Right. Oh, so, right. Instead of, right, discount them. Yeah. That's not how you minister to somebody, no. by discounting them. I promise you that. Yeah. That's not preferring their life over your own, right? right? It's pointing them to a friend or somebody else that maybe ministered differently, yeah. right? Or has a different view. And then you feel great liberty to do that. That's right. You don't feel upset with yourself or with them. Otherwise, you're going to be lured into self-justification, whereby I'm going to justify myself, right? Yeah. By proving that I am as I ought to be. And I'll either prove it by amassing all the things the world says I should have or each person says I should have. I'll either prove it by that or I'll prove it by arguing with people that say I'm not as I ought to be and proving to them they're wrong. Either way is a life filled with strife. Either way is a life of laboring and toiling. There's no rest. There's no ability to enjoy yourself or enjoy God. You're enjoyable. I don't know if you realize that. You're lovely. You're a delight to be around. You got it going on. You rock. There's things in you that, man, nobody else has. There's things in you that God loves to be around. That he can only get from you. He's busy trying to convince you of that. So that you'll like yourself like he likes you. <laughs> he, he's busy trying to convince you. Right? And so God's idea of persuading you that you are as you ought to be is by coming and revealing to you what he thinks about you. And as you see what he thinks about you, and you see that he thought so well of you, he thought he wanted you to be with him for all eternity, that he even came and gave you his eternal life. You'll start to be persuaded that I am as I ought to be. Amen. And you'll lay down the judgments in the world, and you'll lay down the judgments of other people, and your life won't be shaped by that. And then you'll start to enjoy yourself. Yes. Right? Yes. Where you can laugh at yourself. <laughs> right? Listen, I used to turn on my videos and the first few years of the church, and I'd go home and I'd want to go. Like, even the weeks where I thought, oh, that was good this week. <laughs> this week it was good. I'd go home and turn on the radio, and I'm like, oh my God. Lord, Lord, what is wrong with me? Right? Listen, now when I go home, I see myself, and I see how I stuck myself in that chair, and I see myself like spontaneously combusting in that chair, and then I laugh out loud. And I think it's hilarious. I'm like, look at this guy. And, then, bro, and if I was better at video editing, I would video edit out a funny little clip of all my funny movements. And I'd go backwards and forwards. I'd, I'd make like a funny thing. I'd post it on TikTok. Because it is funny, right? Who wouldn't watch that? I mean, when you like slow down my hands and you start looking at all the... I mean, it's hilarious, right? And I, I can enjoy it. And it, it, it's fun. But that's only come from seeing myself in the face of Jesus. And so we were never created to gather evidence about who and what we are from the world or from other people. We were only created to find the evidence about who and what we are from God and what God says to us. Now, we were carnal, and so we couldn't hear what God said. So God said, I'm going to appeal to these guys' senses because they're sensual right now. They're carnal. Their senses are more alive than their spirit. And so he wrapped his word about us inside of human flesh. Jesus. 
Because we could experience Jesus through our senses. We could touch him. We could hear him. We could talk with him. And in talking to Jesus, and touching Jesus, and beholding Jesus, we're beholding ourselves as if we're looking in a mirror. Right? And then we get set free from the judgments in the world, and we start thinking, man, there's nothing wrong with me. Hallelujah. And then you enjoy life. Amen. If you want to, if you want to go spend more time with the idea of what Jesus, or what God thinks about us, I'm just reminded of the messages you did um, on the faith of the Son of God, and how those just over and over again explain how God sees us and how he feels about us and who we are. And it just, man, for me, that was one of like the bedrock principles to build grace upon was those messages during March of 15 or 16. There, to go back and watch those, there was like four, three or four of them. Yeah. They're awesome. They're, they are good. Awesome. So to tie this all back around to a theological thing, you shall have one God, the Lord your God. You shall worship no other gods beside him. So here we all sit, you guys sit, desiring to be as you ought to be. You want to be as you should be, right? Well, you have one God, the Lord your God. That means there's only one person that has the strength to convince you that you are as you ought to be. There's only one person that can convince you of that. It ain't your friend. It ain't your girlfriend. It ain't your boyfriend. It ain't your mom. It ain't your dad. Only God has the ability to persuade you that you are as you ought to be. All of the things you can do with your own hands, all of the things you can amass to yourself, all the things you can perfect, all the different hair transplants I could get to get hair, do not possess the ability to persuade me that I am as I ought to be. Only God has that ability. And so if you desire to, to believe that you're as you ought to be, man, start talking with God about that desire. And start talking with God about how he's the only one that can convince you. You don't even need to know how he convinces you. Just start having that conversation. Lord, I desire to be free from my own judgments. I desire to believe that I am as I ought to be. I no longer desire to look at the people around me or the world around me to determine whether I am as I ought to be or not. Because I see those gods can't convince me. That there's only one God that can convince me, and it's you. And so I need convincing. Right? And you start talking with God about that. You'll find great liberality. I wish I knew this when I was you guys' age. It would have saved me lots of suffering. Lots and lots and lots of suffering. Right? And so that's, that's what you, you want to have in your mind as you walk through this world. Right? Because you'll enjoy yourself, you'll be free from judgments, and you'll enjoy life. Right? Does that make sense? Glory to God. i got to go mess with the internet now.